Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Total Biscuit. Context is a wonderful thing, as is of course the idea of relativism. Everything is relative and many things are subjective. I think we're kind of lucky when it comes to video games that we can be objective about so many things. Since video game development is as much a science as it is an art form, there are mechanics which you can describe as objectively bad, features or problems with the game which you can describe as objectively bad, which is kind of wonderful. If you're trying to critique pure art, that's pretty difficult to do. That's very much open to interpretation, it's very subjective and of course very relative, but we get lucky when it comes to games criticism. If a game runs at sub 30 FPS on a machine that costs as much as a small family car, then we can safely say that the port was badly optimized. If it's lacking key features like rebindable keys or field of view slider in first person games, we can objectively say that it's not fit for purpose. However, that's kind of where things end. A lot of video game criticism wears the veil of objectivity, and it really straddles the line between the two. Because while you could objectively criticize a broken mechanic that doesn't do what it's supposed to do, if the mechanic works, then it really comes down to your opinion of that mechanic, and more often than not, you will find that many people, myself included, try and make sort of objective-ish statements about things which are really quite subjective. That's certainly something that a lot of people, myself included, need to work on when it comes to their criticism, and I think that people could do a much, much better job at it. Regardless, though, most of video game criticism is going to be subjective and it's going to be relative to the person's personal preferences as well as their experience in video games, because that's very much going to color their perception. And nowhere is this more obvious than franchise reboots. Some of the videos that I've been criticized for the most have been of franchise reboots, and more often than not, I find them to be pretty good for the most part. If I go back and look at some of the franchise reboots I have actually assessed on this channel, we look at things like Tomb Raider, which I very much liked, Devil May Cry, which I actually liked, and of course recently Thief, which with some misgivings I actually liked. The thing about franchise reboots is that they seem to be susceptible to the hate boner more so than anything else, and by that I'm really talking about a preconceived notion about the game and a negative bias towards it before the game even comes out, and we see it most commonly with franchise reboots. It was a little bit less so with Tomb Raider, and I think that's probably because the last few Tomb Raider games, with the exception of Lara Croft and the Guardian of Light, weren't actually very good, so it's difficult to look back at the franchise with fond memories when those memories started to peter out at 4 and got worse after that. We are also talking about a franchise that has actually been rebooted twice, by the way, for those who don't realize. You can treat the first six games as the first generation of Tomb Raiders, and then you had three more games. You had Underworld, you had Legend, and you of course had Tomb Raider Anniversary. So I think in that situation, even the diehard series fans were a little bit more willing to accept a new Tomb Raider game because, frankly, the last few had just been an absolute mess anyway. This is not the case with games like Devil May Cry and Thief. Devil May Cry has a storied history, and even though Devil May Cry 2 was not particularly good, the original Devil May Cry is praised for being an extremely difficult hardcore experience that also really pushed the boundaries of that genre in terms of spectacle, and indeed gave birth to the term Spectacle Fighter. It's probably safe to say that without games like Devil May Cry, we would not have had games like God of War, and a plethora of very enjoyable third-person character action games, aka Spectacle Fighters. So, a lot of people really liked the Devil May Cry series, up to and including 4, and then of course when it was rebooted, especially with a different protagonist and different visual style, a lot of people went out of their way to hate it. Yet I liked it. And I was accused of all manner of things as a direct result of that, up to and including the things that are being said of me right now that I was paid off to like Devil May Cry. Naturally, that's a rather annoying accusation. When you go up to someone and say you're taking bribes, that's, that's pretty serious. You know, in many walks of life, taking bribes is illegal, and indeed under FTC regulations, not disclosing that something is a piece of paid-for promotional content is also against the law. 
not something that you really want to be doing, and a fairly serious accusation to make of anybody. And here's the thing, as interesting and amusing as it is to indulge in shadowy conspiracy theories, there is a much, much simpler explanation when it comes to people enjoying games that you do not enjoy, especially when it comes to franchises. Franchises are fraught and plagued with problems when it comes to critiquing, and honestly, it's mostly down to the viewers themselves. Now, that's not to say that the viewers are at fault. In fact, they're not really doing anything wrong, unless, of course, they're running around accusing people of taking bribes or indeed threatening to kill them, in which case, fuck off. They rightfully have certain expectations from a franchise they've invested a lot of time in. And this is where critique of a title, especially a reboot, is extremely difficult, because the chances are that reviewer or critic or whatever has not played hundreds and hundreds of hours of the franchise leading up to that point. Let's take the example of Devil May Cry. So, some people complained about the dumbing down of the series. The dumbing down is a very, very common accusation, and they're kind of right, because the actual combat system is not as difficult as previous Devil May Cry titles. It's a lot easier to get a triple S rank because the ranking system has been changed in DMC as opposed to something like Devil May Cry 3. A lot of the combos are simplified in comparison to the kind of stuff that you could do at the absolute top level when it comes to Devil May Cry 3 or 4. And for people that have played hundreds of hours of the original Devil May Cry games, that is an extremely relevant criticism. However, for those of us who have not played hundreds of hours of the Devil May Cry games, it isn't a relevant criticism. Contrast that, however, with another feature of the game, which is the idea that you can only hurt certain colored enemies with certain colored weapons. Now, this is something that is easier to criticize from the perspective of somebody that has not played hundreds of hours of the original game. Now, a veteran of it would say, this is a terrible idea because it reduces the combat variety. It basically forces you to use certain weapons when you don't necessarily want to do that. Valid criticism. Those who haven't played the original games too much could actually level the same criticism at the game, and plenty of people did notice it, myself included. However, they would probably do so for different reasons. They would most likely find the system annoying. You're in the middle of a combo, particularly when they mix in a couple of different colored enemies into the same fight and the wide swings of some of the weapons end up with you breaking your combo because they make contact with the wrong colored enemy. And the combat isn't precise enough to be able to handle that. That is a criticism that I think you can very easily level at DMC, and I think you would be right. But we're leveling it for a different reason. A Devil May Cry veteran might want to maintain those 400-500 crazy hit combos and really go for their weapon variety, and they're unable to do that because the game deliberately forces them not to. This could also be applied to Thief, for instance. A lot of people have criticized, again myself included, the size of some of the levels. Now, a Thief veteran is most likely going to criticize that due to the fact that the original Thief had massive, sprawling levels. Absolutely huge. And if they enjoyed that experience and they played a lot of it, they would expect a similar experience from the new Thief. So, considering that that isn't there, they're probably going to dislike it. Me, who hasn't played too much of the original Thief games, because when those games first came out, I was a teenager and I actually hated stealth games. Uh, I really, really did has a reason to dislike them simply because small levels limit options. The smaller a level, the more likely it is to be linear because there's less space to actually do what you want to do and pick your own path. Now, the strange thing about that particular criticism is that you're criticizing the same thing, but for different reasons because of your previous experience. You have a different level of expectation. And what that often means, in practical terms, is that a reviewer or a critic is going to be perhaps a little bit more generous to a game that is a franchise title or a reboot than a hardcore fan is going to be. And there are some instances where I personally feel I'm very capable of criticizing a title based on the previous games. Deus Ex is a good example. I went really in-depth on Deus Ex Human Revolution, and I have beaten the original game eight times, give or take. I've also beaten even Invisible War twice. That's all I could stomach, I'm sorry. And, you know, I absolutely hated Invisible War. And I think that even Thief actually suffers from some similar issues to Invisible War. And if I'd played the original Thief games, I would have probably criticized the size of those levels a lot more than I actually did. But I haven't, so I didn't. And you might think, well, your opinion isn't valid then. 
Now, that's something that I hear an awful lot. You haven't played a lot of the previous games, so your opinion isn't valid. Actually, that makes my opinion very valid. WTF is, reviews, critiques of any kind, well, they're all to a greater or lesser extent a buyer's guide. Yeah, they're designed to be useful information in order to determine whether or not you wish to make a purchase, and really it's the only safe way to do so. I often read people saying, oh, well, you should just trust your own opinion. All right, well, feel free to buy all of your games, and when you get burned on them, don't come crying to me. The point of what we do for a living is to help you avoid bad purchases so you don't have to throw down $60 or trust your friend's opinion or whatever. The problem is that even though we try to be as inclusive as possible, we are still very much limited by our own personal experiences. And it's very difficult to put yourself outside of your own shoes in that regard. And usually it's impossible to to do it right. You can try and be as inclusive as possible and say, oh, well, from this perspective, I think blah, blah, blah. But the thing is, that's not the perspective that you hold. So you're only going to be able to provide a very limited notion of what that perspective actually is. Trying to appeal to everyone and trying to understand everybody's point of view is not something that really works from the review or critique kind of aspect. It's got to come from you. It's got to be your personal experience. And why am I saying that just because I don't have a lot of experience in Thief or whatever, that my opinion is very valid, because a lot of people don't have a lot of experience with Thief. As much as the hardcore community would love to believe otherwise, they are the minority. And they have a very specific perspective. And it's cool to hold that perspective, and I actually respect people a lot that dive into games in a really big way, until, of course, they start to get preachy about it. My view on Thief is kind of an everyman's view, whereas my view on something like Deus Ex is actually quite in depth, and I still try and make it as every man as possible, but that was a long video, and I said an awful lot about that game, and I was able to compare and contrast the original very effectively. And sometimes that just happens. Sometimes I have played a lot of a particular franchise, sometimes I haven't, so my view is going to be different. And when you look at a game like Thief, particularly one that evidently has been extremely divisive, in terms of people hating it before it came out, or even, of course, the reviews. You know, there are plenty of people that agree with me on this, but there are plenty of people that disagree with me on it. The reviews are very split. There's plenty of positive reviews. There's also plenty of negative reviews. You really have to take a piece like mine, look at the perspective that I'm providing, and contrast it with your own experiences. Something that Jeff Gersman said an awful lot in regards to the byline, I've mentioned this many times before, but the person that's reviewing it is very, very pertinent information. Take Jeff as an example. He's very dismissive of Dark Souls because he doesn't like that game. So if he happened to be the one doing the review of Dark Souls 2, then that information that we knew he was dismissive about Dark Souls is important because if he ends up liking it, you need to look into that and think, hang on a minute, he disliked the original Dark Souls, yet he really likes Dark Souls 2, why? And funnily enough, him giving Dark Souls 2 a very positive review could potentially be a real negative. I would be surprised if when the Dark Souls review time comes around that Jeff Gersman would be the person to actually do the review on Dark Souls. That seems fairly unlikely. But even if he does it, it's actually very useful information because the things that he dislikes about Dark Souls could be things that you very much enjoy about Dark Souls. It's not about just taking the person's opinion at face value. It's about understanding your own and using the opinions around you to form a consensus. Unfortunately, some people don't seem to understand that, and it comes back to the idea of the hate boner. If I Google Jeff Gersman Dark Souls, I will find, one, his blog post about why he doesn't like Dark Souls, and then... Wonderful opinions from the gaming community. This is why I disregard Jeff Gersman's opinion. This kind of attitude is prevalent. If someone doesn't like, or <laughs> God forbid, likes a game that you dislike, then disregard their entire opinion. No, you jackasses. Pay attention to that opinion. If somebody likes a game that you don't like, that's a really useful little benchmark. For instance, if I like a point-and-click game, you should probably be aware of that point-and-click game, because I'm bad at point-and-clicks, incredibly bad at them. And I really do not understand how to properly critique a point-and-click game from the perspective of somebody that likes that stuff, because I don't value the same things that the people that like point-and-clicks do. It's the same with Dear Esther or Gone Home. A lot of people really like those games. I despise them because I dislike the focus of those games. That doesn't mean that you're supposed to ignore my opinion. You should be using it. I am a tool, as many people have pointed out in the past, but really, I am a tool that you can use to figure out whether or not you are going to like a particular title. If you look at Thief 
and you look at what I'm doing in Thief, particularly in the gameplay. This is why I think WTF is a fantastic format, by the way. Because it's not just what I say that matters, it's what I'm showing. You may spot something in the gameplay that you dislike that I don't even touch on, because it's not a priority to me, but it's a priority to you. Some example with Thief, and you might be saying, why are you reading the comments? Why are you reading the comments? Guys, I'm trying, I really am. But unfortunately, a lot of it gets through to me regardless. There's a lot of ways to contact me, and it's difficult to close off all of them. But people are saying things like, oh, well, you know, it's really weird that you would talk about the guards doing sensible things, yet in this sequence, you know, we see that a guard should have spotted you there and didn't. You know. That points out the differing levels of sensitivity to certain issues based on your experience as a gamer. Some hardcore thief players might want it to be the case that you get instantly spotted, yeah, if you go into line of sight. Now, on normal mode in thief, that does not happen, yeah? On normal mode. In the higher difficulty levels, you get spotted a lot easier. But the way that it works in Thief is there's this little eye indicator, and you can actually hear it as well. There's a little audio effect when you are within sight range. And that eye meter fills up depending on various factors, including how close they happen to be to you, as well as the ambient light levels, whether or not you're moving or actually committing an action of some description. And once that eye meter fills up, they will go to an awareness level, which actually has a certain number of pips above the eye there. Now, if they've spotted to you that eye indicator goes red if they know there's someone around but they don't know exactly where they are that eye indicator goes yellow you saw that in the video when i threw the bottle down the stairs to attract the guard away from my location he knew somebody was there he clearly heard somebody so he was going down to investigate that area and that's how the system actually works but some people might want it to be a case of oh you know you're spotted immediately Personally, I don't like that for a number of reasons. I think that it's unrealistic to expect a guard to instantly spot you in a dark corner, even if you are in their line of sight. It takes time, and that's what that eye meter is designed for. It gives you a little bit of time to move out of the line of sight if you're quick. Alternatively, it gives you the chance to lunge and try and blackjack the guy before he becomes fully alert. These are not guards that are wandering around with their weapons drawn hyper alert about absolutely everything, especially not in the middle of the street. These are watchmen. You know? They don't really want to be there. They're wandering around and they're trying to keep an eye on things, but at the end of the day, they're underpaid watchmen that actually don't really give a damn about their job. So it's kind of to be expected. I don't think appealing to realism is a reasonable argument most of the time, but I'm explaining why I think it's personally okay, whereas other people people will not. Franchises are inherently problematic because you build up a fan base based on the stuff that you made previously, so if you change too much of it in the next iteration, then you end up losing that fan base. However, especially when there's a rather large gap between the games in the franchises and indeed there's a reboot, you're pressing the reset button. You know, it's called a reboot for a reason. And unfortunately, the nature of a reboot more often than not alienates the original fan base. And the problem is that fan base has most likely died off over time. Tomb Raider, I think, is a prime example of that. Was there really a massive Tomb Raider fan base, hardcore fan base left? Well, there's always going to be a hardcore fan base for some. But how big was that fan base? Was it enough to sell two to three million copies of the game? Especially considering the budget that's often put into these. Probably not. And that's the unfortunate business reality of a lot of what's going on here. I think that in certain circumstances, you can indeed reboot a game and hold on to the original mechanics and make everybody happy. But I've never actually seen an instance of that universally happening. Even Deus Ex Human Revolution, which I think did a phenomenal job of continuing a venerated franchise, which certainly had a stumble when it came to Invisible War. Consider the fact that half the Deus Ex games prior to that game ever made were bad. In fact, you could even argue that it would be two-thirds, considering the console version Deus Ex The Conspiracy was also not particularly good. It didn't make everybody happy. Some diehard Deus Ex fans really disliked the new Deus Ex. The alternative, of course, is you go down the route of Call of Duty, where they barely change anything. And we've seen how many people absolutely hate that, but the game still sells a bazillion copies every time they do it. So, honestly, it's almost like some developers are in the position where they're damned if they do, and they are damned if they don't. Call of Duty has a waning fan base. Uh, it is selling less and less every single time. Black Ops 2 was considered to be pretty good, Ghosts is not. Oh, it's just really as simple as that. And one might expect them to really change things around, but if they do that, will they piss off the people that liked Call of Duty in the first place? Because even the fan base that is still there is still absolutely massive. And you've got to be extremely careful. With games like Thief, I'm sad to say that the existing fan base is not massive anymore. That's why, in the view of the developer and publisher, a reboot was needed. They needed to create a new fan base for Thief, and then 
At some point down the line, we may see a Thief 2 or Thief 3, and God, I hope they don't call them that. It's going to be ridiculously confusing. That may very well be better in the eyes of people that love the original Thief games. As a starting point, though, I, again, feel that Thief is a very enjoyable game, and I'm not going to change my opinion on that. It seems highly unlikely unless I end up finishing the game, and I've played, what, about seven hours of it? So that's a, that's a fairly reasonable amount of time to play for a first impression, I feel. Unless it completely jumps the shark towards the end, I will expect that I will maintain my opinion of liking Thief, and that the criticisms that hardcore fans level at it will be valid, but simultaneously not relevant to a lot of people. So what I'm asking of you is that you value different opinions from critics. Understand the position that they come from. Make sure to find out what kind of a person you're dealing with, because that's the most important component of figuring out whether or not this person's opinion lines up with yours and how exactly to contrast it. If you know that I like certain genres, I dislike other genres, I have a focus on mechanics, I'm not too concerned about story, in fact I will for the most part forgive a bad story in favour of good mechanics. I put an emphasis on technical aspects, in particular with PC ports, so I'm likely to look more favourably on a game that has a good PC port and is showing good use of technology. I hate games that I feel shouldn't have puzzles in them when they do, so I tend to dislike games more if they do that. I don't really like cutscenes, I dislike QTEs, I'm more of a multiplayer focused gamer these days, I prefer the more competitive style of small form multiplayer over big team games and so on and so forth. There's a lot of things that I think you need to learn about your favorite critics or let's players or whatever and hopefully you learn it through consuming their media and if someone's good at their job they'll be very clear and obvious about what it is that they like and don't like and then once you have that information you yourself can make an informed decision relative to that. So me liking Thief might be a good reason for you not to like it. It's one of the main reasons I don't give scores. You know, if I gave a game a 95 that means you should like it. No, that is an imaginary thing. That is something that continues to be perpetuated by Metacritic, which is one of the main reasons that I hope it dies off. As I said at the beginning of this video, we're very fortunate as game critics to be able to deal with a medium that is as much science as it is art, that has many features that we can objectively criticize. However, it is still a medium that is rife with relativity and subjectivity. And one man's game of the year can be another's ride to hell retribution. I know we're really wired for that kind of tribal response where we look for others that share our opinions and values, but consider you're probably going to be able to make better purchase decisions if you're able to disconnect yourself from those old urges. Thank you very much for watching, folks. I'll see you next time.